Thank you, Mike. This was an introduction. I now understand when you were referring to the relationship between Earth and space. Well, you know, my chief of staff is in this room and he always calls me the minister of all things being foreign. So, <laughs> so looking forward to working more with you on this. Um, it's a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you for taking the time. It is an important time to be able to talk about foreign policy. And I'm pleased to talk to you about what's happening in the world right now and Canada's role looking forward. But before we dive in, I know that all of us have been following very closely what's happening in the Middle East. We have seen horrific scenes of unspeakable violence as Hamas, as Hamas launched its terrorist attacks against the people of Israel, which Canada unequivocally condemns. What is unfolding in Gaza is also a human tragedy. The humanitarian situation facing the Palestinian people, facing Palestinian women and children in particular, is dire. And extremist settlers' attacks continue in the West Bank and must stop. Like all states, of course, Israel has a right to defend itself against terrorist attacks. It has an obligation to do so in accordance with international law. For even in crisis, there are principles, and even in war, there are rules. We must be guided by human dignity and all civilians, Israeli and Palestinians, for they are equal, must be protected. At this point, Canada mourns seven dead. We are still searching for two who could be held hostage. 400 Canadians are trapped in Gaza. They are living in fear and despair. And as a government, we have a duty to bring them to safety. And that is why we need humanitarian pauses, a humanitarian truce in Gaza. And I've been in contact with Israel, with Qatar, with Egypt and the US nearly every single day for the past three weeks. At this point, we need an agreement from all parties to get our foreign nationals out, including Canadians. All hostages must be released. And it is important to allow food, fuel, and water in Gaza. And Canada will be reaching out to more countries to join in that call. I spent the better part of this last month in Israel, Jordan, Egypt, and the EUAE, overseeing our efforts to help Canadians lead the region and working with our partners to address the impacts of this conflict while finding ways to de-escalate. The region is at a very precarious moment. You can feel the weight of anxiety and pain in the streets and at the highest levels of government. While we face the immediate and urgent impacts of this crisis, we must also look forward looking forward to a political horizon and towards peace. And these conversations of how we can build a better future, supporting a two-state solution where Israeli and Palestinian civilians can live side by side in peace and security, and where the Palestinian right of self-determination is respected, are conversations I will never shy away from. Il est important pour moi de commencer cet événement sans aborder les derniers développements au Moyen-Orient, c'est important qu'on puisse en parler, que nous avons tous suivi avec grande attention. Le 7 octobre dernier, nous avons tous été témoins des violences inexcusables lorsque le Hamas a décidé de lancer son attaque terroriste contre les Israéliens et contre Israël. Le Canada a condamné sans équivoque cette attaque. Dans les derniers jours, Nous assistons également à une tragédie humaine à Gaza. La situation humanitaire qu'affronte le peuple palestinien, notamment les femmes et les enfants, est extrêmement difficile. En Cisjordanie, les attaques de colons extrémistes continuent et doivent cesser. Comme tous les États, Israël a le droit de se défendre contre les attentats terroristes. Il doit le faire en respectant le droit international. Car même en temps de crise, il y a des principes à respecter. Et même en temps de guerre, Il y a des règles à suivre. Nous devons être guidés par nos valeurs de dignité humaine. Les civils, autant que les Israéliens, 
et que les Palestiniens doivent être protégés et traités de la même manière. À ce jour, le Canada déplore sept morts. Nous sommes toujours à la recherche de deux personnes qui pourraient être détenues en otage. 400 Canadiens sont pris au piège à Gaza. Ils vivent dans la peur et le désespoir. Et en tant que gouvernement, nous avons le devoir de les protéger et de les sortir de cette situation intenable. C'est pourquoi nous avons besoin de pauses humanitaires, d'une trêve humanitaire à Gaza. Et donc, je suis en contact avec le Qatar, Israël, l'Égypte, les États-Unis, presque de tous les jours depuis trois semaines. Nous avons besoin d'un accord de toutes les parties pour faire sortir les ressortissants étrangers, y compris les Canadiens. Nous devons aussi libérer tous les otages et nous devons permettre à la nourriture, au carburant et à l'eau d'entrer dans la bande de Gaza. Le Canada va demander à d'autres pays de se joindre à l'appel. Nous allons toujours soutenir une solution en deux États où les Israéliens et Palestiniens peuvent vivre côte à côte dans la paix et la sécurité et où les droits des Palestiniens à l'autodétermination sera respecté. Now, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright once said that, contrary to what many people think, international relations is nothing like a game of chess where two people sit quietly, thinking out their strategy, taking time between moves. It is much more like a game of pool with a bunch of balls clustered together. Based on my experience over the past two years, I completely agree. And I would add that, while it has never been perfect, the game has been well served by a set of common rules, conceived from the ashes of the war to form the basis of global cooperation. Lines we would not cross to keep our citizens safe, built on the promise that through stability, would grow prosperity. Today, this system is cracking, and the stakes of the game have increased. Our world is marked by geopolitical turbulence, unpredictability, and uncertainty. The tectonic plates of the world order are shifting beneath our feet, and the structures that are built upon them are fracturing. War has broken in Europe, in Africa, and in the Middle East, each bringing a new cycle of death and destruction. We find ourselves amidst an international security crisis. We are now facing increasing complex modern challenges, climate change, artificial intelligence, political polarization, irregular migration, and deepened inequality. More than ever, our international institutions are being tested. The stability that has safeguarded us all is now being challenged by those who seek, seek to change the rule of the games, undermined by those who believe they can break them without consequence. The current world order is also being questioned by people and nations, mainly from the South, who challenge whether the rules reflect their reality and benefit their people. Some have expressed concerns over double standards or whether the current institutions and their decisions meet their needs or are fair. We see an increasing boldness from bad actors who believe they can tip the scales of power with the weight of their might. These countries and non-state actors seek to reshape the very rules that has kept us safe. And the tools they're using are not limited to the battlefield. Many actors now wield sophisticated and often covert tactics to shift the world order in their favor. And they're doing so at a time where global issues have local impact here at home. Crisis in the Middle East has sparked fear in our communities. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has cost thousands of lives and spiked the price of our gas and groceries. Climate change filled our summer skies with smoke. And rising global inflations make it feel increasingly hard to get by, let alone get ahead. 
Notre monde est marqué par les turbulences géopolitiques, par l'improvisabilité et par l'incertitude. Les plaques tectoniques de l'ordre mondial bougent sous nos pieds et les structures qui s'appuient sur elles sont en train de se fracturer. La stabilité qui nous a offert une certaine protection est aujourd'hui mise à l'épreuve par ceux qui cherchent à changer les règles du jeu. Un défi complexe générationnel nous attend et c'est un test que nous ne pouvons pas échouer. Ahead of us lies a complex generational challenge, one that will shape the world we leave to our children and grandchildren. They will judge us based on the steps we take next, and on how well we were able to prevent global conflict to build a world that is stable and inclusive, one that respects the sovereignty and independence of all states while recognizing their growing interdependence, and one where progress benefits all of society, not just a narrow few. Friends, this is a test we cannot fail. At this moment of global crisis and deep uncertainty, Canada can make significant contributions to meet this challenge. To do so, our foreign policy will be guided by two principles. First, defending our sovereignty. And second, using pragmatic diplomacy to engage countries of different perspectives in order to prevent an international conflict. Notre politique étrangère sera guidée par deux principes. Premièrement, nous défendrons notre souveraineté. Et deuxièmement, nous utiliserons une diplomatie pragmatique qui implique de créer des liens avec des pays ayant des points de vue différents des nôtres dans le but ultime de prévenir un conflit international. Canada's sovereignty must be resilient to threats of every nature, regardless of where they originate. Our location on the globe, surrounded by three oceans, can no longer be relied upon to protect us. The evolving threats we face are no longer just physical and economic. They're digital and they're informational. Our national security depends on a world order where the principles of sovereignty are respected, one where borders cannot be redrawn by force, one where threats to our people don't go unanswered, and one where trade and prosperity is ensured through sustainable peace and stability. Defending these rules is critical to defending our national interest. And so, we will strengthen the security of our territory, our economic interests, our democracy, and our culture. And we're working with our allies to bolster international security, and in turn, Canada's. Now more than ever, soft and hard power are important. We will increase our investments in our military through the defense policy update, which the minister of Defense, Bill Blair, is finalizing. Defending our sovereignty means that diplomacy must be part of our security apparatus. So if you look at a map and think about where Canada is, let's see at what we'll do with looking to our south. We will continue working with our closest friend and greatest ally, the United States, to strengthen the protection of our shared border. We will put in place the agreements we need to implement an immigration strategy that is fair and compassionate. And we'll continue to defend our shared skies through a stronger and much more integrated NORAD. And the purchase of 88 F-35 fighter jets will help us in this regard. Now let's look to the east. We are meeting our transatlantic responsibilities, and we are a partner that NATO can count on. This summer alone, we have committed to expand our presence along NATO's eastern flank and upgrade the multinational battle group we lead in Latvia. And we know that Ukraine's sovereignty is fundamental to the world's stability and to our stability. And so we'll continue to strengthen their position on the battlefield. We'll support their 
pursuit of peace, and we will help them with its post-war reconstruction. As now we look to the West, great power competition is deepening in the Indo-Pacific region. Interstate tensions, many with historical roots, are flaring or re-emerging. Stepping up as a reliable partner that concretely contributes to peace and security in the region means increasing our military presence, investing in border and cybersecurity, increasing our intelligence capacity. And as we look to the future, I believe we should be as close to Japan and South Korea as we are to the UK, France, Germany, and Italy. And we should invest in a relationship with ASEAN, which is a group of Asian countries, as much as we are doing so with the EU. Indeed, a relationship with India is facing a difficult moment. We stand by the decision to inform Canadians of credible allegations around the killing of a Canadian citizen. This is, at its core, a question of protecting our national sovereignty and Canadian safety. In addressing this serious matter, we remain engaged with the Indian government. It is important to remember that this is one moment in a relationship that spans decades and is built upon strong connection between our two people. Now, turning north, Canada's true north is what makes us unique. And we cannot understate the importance of safeguarding the Canadian Arctic. With climate change redrawing maritime routes, more countries are turning their eyes to our north. The Arctic is becoming more accessible, more attractive to those who want to research this region or do business within it. This is true for Russia. This is also true for China, who is now calling itself a near Arctic state. Exercising our sovereignty on Canadian Arctic land and waters is, at, is a fundamental priority for Canada. This includes safeguarding the Northwest Passage, which serves as a gateway to the Arctic. We will make the investments necessary to reinforce our northern security. We'll also invest in economic development in the region in partnership with indigenous peoples. We, of course, will partner with the United States, and we will invest diplomatically in our relationships with Northern European countries. I mean by that Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland, who also believe that the Arctic is a region where the rule of law should prevail. Now let's talk about democratic sovereignty. Because Canada is a proud democracy. We have a long democratic tradition, two official languages, a rich multicultural society, a dedication to reconciliation, and a deep commitment to the rule of law. This is who we are. It is a big part of what attracts immigrants from all around the world. And I know many Canadians are hurting when they look at the state of the world. This is why it's even more important to protect our democracy here at home because we can never take it for granted. We need to nurture it because nurturing it is a choice, one that we must make every day. Extremist and populist movements are on the rise around the world, and we should not be naive because we're not immune to them. We all have a role to play in defending our democracy, including politicians on both sides of the aisle. Because what we say matters, and silence speaks even louder. We must be clear in denouncing those who seek to undermine our democracy, and in promoting the importance of the simplest and most powerful expression of it, which is a vote. We will protect our people from all forms of foreign interference. We will not tolerate it in our elections, in our media, or in our social media. 
not among our students, not in our society. Foreign interference is not new. We're not the only country facing it, but it is evolving, and so must our approach. We have created independent panels to monitor elections and established a foreign interference public inquiry. We are establishing a foreign actor registry to protect communities that are often targeted. And as I've made myself very clear, any foreign diplomat who engages in this type of activity will be sent packing. Finally, essential to protecting the health of our democracy, we will continue to protect our cultural sovereignty and defend the integrity of our media. Now, I've talked to you about our first principle, which is defending our sovereignty. Let's now speak about our second, which is pragmatic diplomacy. Our sovereignty survives best in a system based on clear and fair rules that foster predictability. And we'll continue to champion that system without ever compromising our values. But friends, we must be pragmatic. We must resist the temptation to divide the world into rigid ideological camps, for the world cannot be reduced to democracies versus autocracies, to the North versus the South, the East versus West. Forcing the majority of the world to fit into any one category would be naive, short-sighted, and counterproductive. Naive because the Global South cannot afford to choose one camp over the other. Short-sighted because the challenges we face will require all states, despite their differences, to cooperate and respect fundamental rules. And counterproductive because forcing states to choose one side over the other risks driving potential partners away. Et donc, nous devons être pragmatiques. Nous devons résister à la tentation de diviser le monde en camps idéologiques rigides, car le monde ne peut se résumer à démocratie contre autocratie, l'Est contre l'Ouest, Nord contre le Sud. Il serait naïf, à courte vue, et contre-productif de forcer la majorité du monde à entrer dans l'une ou l'autre de ces catégories. I'm inspired by the diplomacy of our past, pragmatic diplomacy of our past. While I was in North Macedonia just last August, I was struck by a statue of former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau in the halls of the Foreign Ministry in Skopje, marking the time he invested as a Western leader to engage with non-aligned countries. At a time of great divide between the West and the Soviet Union, Trudeau was determined to connect with countries that did not see themselves, their values or needs, reflected in the state of play. And throughout that time of tension, Canada was seen as a credible partner to engage countries in peace and stability. To me, that's pragmatic diplomacy. Keeping allies close, while also being open to different perspectives as we encourage others to take a chance on peace. We will always defend our national interests. We will always defend our values. But we cannot afford to close ourselves off from those with whom we do not agree. For engagement does not mean that we support or condone the policies and actions of others. We're not naive about what engagement will accomplish. But if we refuse to engage, we create additional incentives for those whose actions we strongly oppose to join together. As respects for the rules diminishes, empty chairs serves no one. Let me be clear, I'm a door opener, I'm not a door closer. Therefore, with rare exceptions, Canada will engage. With the world's security at stake, our security at stake, we cannot just rely on our old friends we will double down on forward-leaning engagement. And we will need to extend our hand 
to new partners amongst a broad coalition of states from around the world. We need to demand that every country respects the sovereignty and territorial integrity of others. This is a defining principle of the UN Charter. Canada will work to promote agreement on these basic principles. Because if we succeed in promoting agreement on the basic rules amongst a larger group of states, every state and every region of the world will benefit. How do we propose to do this? We must learn from our history. Canadians have played a key role in creating our international rules and institutions. It is now our responsibility that our international system progress with its time. It must be reformed to address the ever-evolving peace and security challenges the world is facing. Therefore, we're committing to increase our presence at the United Nations and in multilateral institutions. And we will also respond to the frustration and call for change from low and middle income countries as we focus on making both the World Bank and the IMF more effective. If we are able to build a more stable world, diplomacy is one critical tool. We must use it to strengthen Canada's security infrastructure and to rebuild the world's security infrastructure. Ensuring that Canadian diplomacy is fit for purpose in this 21st century is fundamental to our success. Diplomats are on the front lines of our work around the world. There are ears and eyes on the ground. Their work is one key to our collective peace and security and the power of our embassies lies in our, our ability to advance common objectives. That is why we're increasing our diplomatic footprint with six new embassies along Europe's eastern flank, in Armenia, in Rwanda, and in Fiji for the Pacific Islands. And that is also why we appointed a new ambassador to the African Union and reappointed an ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We're also currently looking at ourselves, taking an honest look in the mirror and undertaking transformational change at Global Affairs Canada through the future of diplomacy work. And we will invest more so that we have the people, the tools, and the global presence we need to succeed now and in the future. The world is at an inflection point. We're in the midst of a geopolitical rebalancing. Global powers are shifting their weight to disrupt the peace that Canadians fought and gave their lives for. As increasingly frequent and complex crises shake the foundation of the system that has kept us safe. We must now chart a path towards building a steady footing for our children, reinforce the international system that has brought about global stability and reshape it to become more inclusive. Canadians can be assured that our eyes are wide open to this challenge and we are dedicated to ensuring that Canada and our diplomats around the world are equipped to tackle these challenges. And I commit to providing Canadians with an update of this work each year. Nous appuierons Nous nous appuierons sur l'héritage diplomatique du Canada avec humilité et détermination. And let me close with this promise. We will build on Canada's diplomatic legacy. We will harness the strength of our people. We will draw from their compassion and creativity. And we will do so with humility and determination. Thank you so much. Merci. Okay, so that was
fantastic. You took us around the world in 25 minutes. <laughs> you talked about pragmatic diplomacy, so we're going to have the most pragmatic Q&A session one has ever seen. Out with the preambles, onto the questions. Yeah, go ahead. So bear with I'm us ready, as ready. we go about five minutes over our period. Minister, this is an economic audience, so yep. obviously my first question is going to be one of an economic nature. Yeah, of course. Based on your speech, what should this audience take away from your speech in terms of how do they navigate the world as it's becoming? Well, I understand uh, where you come from. Why? Because I used to be in business before being in politics. And one of the key things that you do when you're in business is you try to mitigate risks. And so the issue right now is how do you do so? Because when you look back, in 2008, following the economic crisis, the world came together. Now, following COVID, this is not what's happening. You're seeing that there's more tensions, more fractures, and at the same time, you see it in even the resiliency of our different supply chains. So, when you go abroad, please work with our diplomats talk to our trade commissioner, talk to our ambassadors, because they will help you understand the country in which you're doing business, but also they can provide you with important networks. And trust me, the politics in different countries is shifting very quickly. So that is why it's really important that you be able to connect with them. And also we're opening new embassies, as I mentioned, so that's also helpful. And meanwhile, we'll continue to invest in trade and, and making sure that we have rules that are, the rules that are keeping us safe, uh, really respected around the world. So, um, last year you launched the Indo-Pacific strategy. Yeah, and I'm really thrilled that here, Pierre Pettigrew. Mr. Yes. Pettigrew, please stand up just for one moment. Yes, there's Pierre Pettigrew and Art Ingleton here. Good to see you both, thank you so much. Merci, mon cher Pierre. So Janice, myself, and Pierre had a chance to work with you on this. It was yeah. a, an honor of a lifetime. We heard you talk about India. You know, we could talk about China. That's a completely different speech. It would take much longer. Tell us, how do we move forward with India in the short term, in the medium term? Obviously, the long term you talked about, but give yeah. us a little bit of detail on what can we do now. Yeah, well, I think a couple of things. First, when it comes to India, you heard me saying it. We stand by the credible allegations. We... Um, also continue to engage with India. I've been in contact with the foreign minister, with uh, Minister Jashankar, and we will continue to do so. Because as mentioned, we have a long-term approach when it comes to India, because this is a relationship that spans decades, and, and we all know that um, we have very strong people-to-people -people ties mm -hmm. with the country. Now, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific strategy also, it is important that we engage with many different countries of the region. And as we speak, I know that the Minister of Trade, uh, Mary Ng, is in Japan with an important delegation, a commercial trade uh, delegation. And that's just an example of the fact that our Indo-Pacific strategy is being implemented. Um, this was one that I thought would be really interesting. You've been in post for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think any one of us uh, could ever imagine, including yourself, that you would have had the hmm. run that you've had. What has surprised you the most in this role? Hmm. Um, I remember saying to Anita Anand about Ukraine, who just had been appointed. She was a defense, I, you know, foreign affairs. And I said, this will be our first crisis. We have to be ready. We'll be tested. And it was. Three months later, Ukraine, the Ukraine war started and Russia invaded Ukraine. I never thought, though, that there would be so many crises at the same time. And at this point, we've done three evacuation. We've evacuated Canadians from Ukraine, from Sudan, and from Tel Aviv, the West Bank. And we're working on Gaza right now. And we are also um, working on Lebanon. And I had to shelter two times in bomb shelters while going to Ukraine and recently in Tel Aviv while Hamas was launching rockets on Israel. And so I never thought I would, well, I, I think nothing prepares you to also have so many difficult conversations. I've met with families of, of 
uh, people who lost their lives in the Hamas attacks. I met with um, family members that thought that their child was potentially a hostage and was confirmed to be dead. I spoke yesterday with a Canadian that is stuck with his family in Gaza because he had gone to see his mom who was sick and he was there on October 7th when Hamas launched attacks. This is the type of conversation that I never thought I would be having. I could sit here and ask you questions forever. I promised you that we would um, be respectful of people's time. I just want to say um, on behalf of Canadians that are in this room and those who are not, thank you for your hard work. Thank you. For your optimism. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Farah. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the young people who are in this room today. Thank you for being such a great example mm -hmm. of what happens when you take your hard work, your enthusiasm, your optimism, but you really start at an age where we will see you grow mm -hmm. and you set the bar very high for everyone else who wants to get into global affairs. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. Pleasure. Thank you, Farah. That was the, probably the most pragmatic fireside chat in the history of the Economic Club. Well done. A round of applause for Farah. That was awesome. <laughs> but to, to echo what Farah uh, has mentioned, Minister Jolie, we thank you so very much for being here. We know your time is limited and your presence is needed in all parts of the globe. So you being here today to address the audience and the media, we deeply appreciate it. A big thanks to MDA and Amazon Web Services for their support today. And of course, a big thank you to all of you for attending. We deeply appreciate you being here. We hope that you have a lovely day and we'll see you at the next Economic Club event. Thank you.